Tim, how about this momentum? <laughs> how great is this? I mean, you know, I, I always uh, think about momentum. Professionally, it's like Christmas, Hanukkah, and Kwanzaa all rolled into <laughs> one from a business standpoint. You know, Tim, I, I was thinking this morning, I mean, you are probably the most amazing social leader I've ever met in my life. You. You're an educator, you're an author, you're a film producer, and you have your PhD. And a so, lot of help, a lot of help. I, so I'm thinking, well, what do I have in common with you? <laughs> and I came up with five things. You wanna All hear right. Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> Well, we're both uh, former CEOs of our organization yeah, who continued right. on as chairman. Nice. We both have five children and married above ourselves. Nice. You, Linda, myself, nice. Meta. We both believe in the, and inspired in the magical powers of uh, persons with intellectual disabilities. Yeah. Number four, for guys who were born in uh, the late 50s, we both have great hair. <laughs> You have better color than I do. I got to work on that. <laughs> and, and number five, we're both from the Kennedy family. <laughs> okay, four out of five. Anyway. So, Tim, maybe just to kick it off, uh, tell this group, uh, this beautiful docu family, about the mission, uh, the size, the scope of the Special Olympics. I was blown away three years ago when I really first got introduced to it. Yeah, well, so, so first of all, thanks, Keith. Thanks for not kicking me, and thanks for, uh, for welcoming me to the family here. This, you know, this, it's interesting to, to listen to these conversations and hear about big enterprises like IBM or major enterprises like the city of San Francisco, and you're probably thinking, what is a small charity that does track and field events for kids with Down syndrome have in common with all that? The, the reality is actually a lot more than you'd think. We, we, today, uh, the Special Olympics movement is in 170 countries. Uh, we have independent, uh, charitably registered organizations in each of those countries. Their mission, their licensees, if you will. Their mission is to empower people with intellectual disabilities, the most forgotten and isolated population on earth, through the power of sport to be included and welcomed and treated with dignity and respect. There's 5.3 million Special Olympics athletes who are a part of our movement, were a part of our movement last year. That adds up to about 100,000 games a year, 108,000 to be exact. So that's a, that's, a, that's a Special Olympics competitive experience about every eight minutes around the world. That means a person with an intellectual disability, their mom or dad, their coach, a volunteer, a team gets on the playing field, has an opening ceremony, is a, in, uh, inspired to see themselves as an Olympic champion, competes, comes in first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, or seventh, gets recognized for that contribution, and hopefully creates a wave of energy that transforms the fear and stigma that so many of them struggle against into a culture of welcome. I mean, it, it is just such an amazing, noble cause. And uh, two years ago, here at uh, Momentum, I had a chance to announce the DocuSign Impact Foundation. And we highlighted the Special Olympics in terms of that mission of transforming uh, lives through transforming noble causes. And I'll never forget uh, your CTO, Noah Broadwater, said, of course, you're coming to the World Summer Games in LA. And I go, absolutely. <laughs> and it was an experience I'll never forget. Uh, you know, hey, these are the athletes that DocuSign's enabling. Hey, we want you to march into the Coliseum with the German team. And I'll tell you, it was, uh, I, uh, such a feeling of inspiration, love, and joy. And to see the, what the Special Olympics does for persons with intellectual disabilities. So last year at Momentum, I told that story and I got to hold the Special Olympics torch while it was on the way to Austria. And then and I, I talked about that story. And then a few months later, that's when I first met you, my neighbor's house. Mike and Holly uh, Depatier, and I heard you tell uh, your story. And it is an amazing story that you chronicled in uh, Fully Alive. And, and you, I remember what you said, you go, well, you're coming to the Winter Games in Grass, <laughs> Austria? I go, absolutely. And um, you know, when you talked about it, uh, you talked about opening up uh, yourself, especially. So when I went to Grass, you know, just a few months ago, 
that was a life-changing uh, experience for me. I was transformed by these magical powers. So we were trying to do something for the Special Olympics, you did for the athletes, but in return, that's the reciprocal magical power. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is, this is the, agen the issue of our time, I think, is to, in some ways, figure out what's the alchemy, what's the architecture, what's the experiential uh, power of encounter. I think we come out of a time when we would have thought of service. We, we would have thought of people saying, I'm going to give something to help people with intellectual disabilities. That's still true. People with intellectual disabilities need supports. Uh, they're victimized, excluded, isolated, uh, stigmatized, ridiculed, and humiliated all over the world. It's, um, it's the civil rights uh, social revolution that most people don't even know is going on. We, we know about social change. We are in the midst of it, and this city is an, is an epicenter of it. But most people don't even know that people with intellectual disabilities are still on the sidelines in most places. What we are coming to understand is that it's not just a movement for them, but it's also a movement from them. That in, uh, you know, we watch people run races, uh, and everybody cheers and watches, and you see, you know, the iconic pose of the Special Olympics athlete. Um, I don't know how uh, alive you guys are, but the iconic pose, I could ask you now, no matter what position you finish, let's say you're all running races here, <clears throat> and uh, let's just take a number. Everybody finishes, you all, each of you individually finish your 100 race, whoops, in fourth. So uh, what's the position of the Special Olympics athlete finishing in fourth? Right. Come on now, come on now, come on. Let's see, don't you, do you have it in you? There you go, look at that. So that's- Dr. Dance. Now, so if you're on the sidelines, you're watching that athlete fin run his race, you know when he or she was born, it was probably a tough day for mom and dad. You know that no preschools wanted that kid. You know he talked or she talked or walked a little later than most kids. You know they struggle to find friends, and they get their race, and they get their moment, and their arms are up in the air, and I have come to be more interested in what happens to us. Yes. And this is, in a way, the story of my own family. My, my mother is one of nine children. Uh, many people in her family are, are extremely well known. Her brother is President of the United States, two brothers, senators, and so on. I mean, big, iconic uh, fame, if you will, notoriety, uh, recognition. But it was Rosemary, who was born in 1918, who had an intellectual disability, who I think uh, transformed that family from one that could have been purely focused on ambition and uh, greed, if you will, and, uh, and success, which it had all those. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to sugarcoat it. There was a lot of ambition. There is a lot of ambition. But Rosemary made it a family that was equally compassionate in some ways. And so in some ways, the legacy of my mother and her brothers, um, which most people think of in the context not just of politics, but of social change, right. of civil rights, of dignity for the poor, of uh, opportunity and service, I think all that came from Rosemary's capacity to uh, inspire her brothers and sisters. I mean, it is a, it is amazing uh, story. I mean, your book, Fully Alive, has, uh, uh, I mean, it, it's probably one of the most inspirational books, probably the most that I've ever had a chance to read. Thank you. Now, in there, you have a story about your Uncle Jack, President yeah. Kennedy. Uh, you know, uh, tell us about that and, it, yeah. and the story that your Uncle Ted and your yeah. mom told before they went. Well, I was, I'm fast, I was, I have been fascinated because this became my life, education and, uh, and inclusion became my life. So I asked my uncle one night about seven or eight years ago, obviously, when he, both he and my mom were alive, I said, what impact do you think Rosemary had on your life? Not on your legislative track record, not on the ADA or passing bills or these kinds of things, public policy, but on you as a human being. And he said, well, you know, I remember this one story cleared his throat. This was at Sunday dinner with 100 kids running around, so it wasn't exactly a focused environment. But he cleared his throat. He said, I'll remember this one story. He said, you know, we went to a party down in Palm Beach. And we all went. And, uh, of course, Mother said, uh, include you bring Rosemary along. 
So uh, he turned to my mother, Uni, you were there, and uh, Jack was there, and Rosie was there, and we were all at the pool. It was a lunch party. And I looked out at one moment, and I, I saw Rosemary. And she was sitting down uh, at the end of the pool with her legs in the water all by herself. And all the other young people were talking and having a good time. And I looked over, and I saw Jack. And he was with all the pretty girls. Uh, uh, and uh, I saw him get up, and he walked right in front of me, by me, and he went down to the edge of the pool where Rosemary was sitting, and he put his feet in the water. And he was there, they were together, alone. And he said, I'll never forget that, as long as I live. Now, he was probably 70, I don't know, 72, four or five when he told me that story. Um, clearly it had printed in him uh, an image of his brother who would become the most powerful, arguably, if you believe the language, arguably the most powerful man on earth if right. you're the President of the United States. And his sister was arguably one of the most powerless people on earth, together, alone. And I, th I think he remembered it in part because he saw that his sister needed that support and that she'd be alone and ashamed without it, but also because he needed her. That in that encounter, something uh, occurred to him that he saw in himself and in his family a different way of being accepted and loved and welcomed. And I think in some ways it's the agenda for all of us. We all have shame. They grew up in a time when they were told to be ashamed of their sister. I mean, it wasn't a subtle thing. Um, and we're all trying to find the space. Uh, we come to work. We work at great companies. We work in innovation and creativity. We work in a family. Why? Because we want to belong. We want to matter. We want to feel free to be our best selves. Uh, I think um, our movement is really no longer a charity for a small group of people who have had a bum rap. It's now a movement of people who want to unlock the power of inclusion to transform the world. And I think that came, uh, that was the hidden gift of one sister, isolated and ashamed, perhaps, but welcomed and loved by her brothers and sisters who took her energy and have given it to the rest of us to carry forward into the world. I mean, that, that, that is amazing. impact that Rosemary had yeah. on this family and now look at the Special Olympics 5.3 million special athletes around the world I mean it is amazing and uh, so the next big world games the summer games yeah. you're gonna do in Abu Dhabi uh, first time you've ever had world games in the Middle East tell us about that and uh, some of the challenges uh, that you face, because this has just taken it to a whole new level. Well, it's, uh, you know, I was in Abu Dhabi two weeks after the inauguration uh, of the president, uh, our current president, uh, in the middle of the Arab world, announcing a global event focused on tolerance and inclusion. Uh, I mean, you had to pinch myself, like, how the heck did this happen? Like, how did I end up here? Uh, sitting next to, as close as you are to me, the Minister of Tolerance of the United Arab Emirates. They have a Minister of Tolerance. Uh, listening to the Crown Prince describe uh, the ideals of Islam about mercy and compassionate, the most common word in the Quran is the word compassion. And asking, in effect, the athletes of Special Olympics to come there to help them tell a new story about themselves. Uh, I mean, I, uh, you, like I said, you couldn't make it up. The, the, the hopefulness of this moment for us, tw two years from now, we'll have 7,000 people with intellectual disabilities from 170 countries arrive in the United Arab Emirates to celebrate inclusion, to commit themselves. And, you know, this is where you know, a room like this, I just want to, you know, I don't want to miss the chance. Look, we, we're the largest public health organization in the world yep. for people with intellect. We do hundred, hundreds of thousands of health screenings a year, most of them on paper, I'm sorry to say. 
uh, most of them without the adequate support to marshal the data and the technology right. to turn that health information into a health justice revolution. We have the largest community, one of the largest communities globally of, of volunteers and coaches looking at fitness and health and nutrition. We have no network, we have no digital platform for them to work together, to enter data, to sign in, if you will. We have, we have uh, millions of young people who are in schools in this country who are trying to create inclusive environments in their schools. And if you ask them what's the big issue, I mean, you talked about the millennials and the centennials, some of them are probably here, that we talk about their selfishness and their eccentricities and all that stuff. But if you look at their social conscience, the issue on their mind is inclusion. We need to transform all of our platforms. Honestly, Lonnie Snyder's here, works, leads our digital efforts, but we need so much help to create the kind of health justice, inclusion revolution, fitness and nutrition, but ultimately to be able to tell the story of the hundreds of millions of people, both those with intellectual challenges and those without, who want to work together to create platforms for, for this kind of message around the world. I believe uh, the greatest threat in this century is not weapons of mass destruction, but what I call attitudes of mass destruction. I think the world is sitting right, hanging in the balance. Do we go for fear, walls, boundaries, and there's a little bit of that in all of us. Or do we go for inclusion right. and openness right. and trust? And do we create the architecture to let that side win? I think um, that's our challenge. Our challenge is to build a worldwide network of people committed to making sure that inclusion wins in this century. And that's why we need your help. And that's why I'm so proud to be here and grateful for your, for your support and attention. <laughs> Well, I can tell you, uh, as the chairman of the DocuSign Impact Foundation, we'll do whatever we can to help this noble cause of Special Olympics. As the Special Olympics and people with intellectual disabilities help transform the world, 